Okay, so this slideshow includes the math elements of research methods that you need to know for the social psychology approach. Now, the first bit that we're going to look at are measures of central tendency. Now, hopefully you will have learned about these before within GCSE maths. We've got the mode, which is the most frequent occurring value. Um, so within a set of data, you know, the number that appears the most. The median, which is the middle value. Now, it's really important to remember with the median that you must first order the scores from smallest to biggest before you calculate the middle value. And we've got the mean, often referred to as the average. Now, the mean is the nasty one because it makes us add up all the scores together and then divide by the number of scores. So if we have a little bit look here at how this works within the numbers, the mode is the number that occurs the most frequently. So if you look at the data set on the screen, the number 50 appears four times and therefore the mode is 50. If we look at a slightly more difficult data set, you will see that actually on this occasion there are two modes. The mode is five and the mode is six. Please don't forget that there can be three modes, four modes, but also if there is not one number or one data set that occurs more frequently, then we say there is no mode. If we look at the median, as we said before, the median is the middle value, but you must remember to order the data first and then calculate the number that's in the middle. So on the screen, the middle number is 85, therefore the median is 85. Now with the median, this can occur where actually we have more than one number in the middle. So for example, I've ordered my data and actually my two middle values are 85 and 95. Now, statistically, you should add these numbers together and then divide by two to find the middle point. But if I'm honest on here, we know that the number in the middle of 85 and 95 is 90. So we would say that in this case, the median is 90. It's really important that you know this, girls, because you need to understand how this is applied as well. So the SAMs, the sample assessment materials released by Edexcel, this is an example question. Now, a researcher collected 20 responses, described one way that they could analyse this data. If we have a look at the mark scheme, you can see that saying using a measure of central tendency will only get you one mark. But if you outline that you understand that that is to analyse the frequency or the spread or the average, then that will get you two marks for this question. Also, you could put that you can use a statistical test, but for one mark. For the second mark, you need to explain that you understand that that will analyse the significance or the, sig the amount of significance within the results. It's also important that you understand the advantages and disadvantages of each of these measures because you need to be able to say which one is more appropriate to use when. So, for example, the mean is, uses all the data and that's a real advantage. However, the disadvantage is, is that one number, a very large or a very small number, can distort the answer. So, if you've got a mean of the numbers 2, 2, 3, 4, 5 and then 30, that number 30 will greatly increase the mean and therefore the mean is not an average of the data because it's been affected by what we call an outlier. Now, the median is great because these outliers don't affect the median. If you've got a really big or a really small number at either end, it doesn't matter because you're looking in the middle. However, if your data set is 100 values or 1,000 values, it's going to take you a really long time to order those numbers in order to be able to calculate the middle number. Now, the mode is the only average we can use when the data isn't just numerical. So if we're looking at the number of responses that occurs to the most, we might be able to talk about the number of yes, no, I don't know responses. However, think about it, if you had 20 yes responses and 20 no responses, then actually you'd in the mode on this piece of data is absolutely no use to you because it won't tell you anything about the data because yes and no responses are exactly the same. Moving on to measures of dispersion. Now, a measure, a measure of dispersion is something that will tell you how spread out the data is. Um, if we move on. The first one that you need to know is the range. Now, again, this is the simplest. You should have covered this in, in GCSE maths. And it tells you how spread out um, the, the distribution of the numbers is. Now, the range is nice and easy to calculate. It's the difference between the highest and the lowest value. And to calculate that, we just take it away. So we take the highest value, and we take away the lowest value from that. Now, what's worth looking at with the range is that extreme values, these outliers that we discussed before, can have a real impact upon the range. So if you look at the data set on the screen here, you can see that the smallest value is 10, the biggest value is 14. Therefore, the range is 4 because 14 minus 10 is 4. If we change one of those sets of data, so if we change the 14 to a 20 as on the screen now, my range changes from 4 to 10. Now, that's just an example of how the range can be affected uh, and it's a disadvantage by just one set of data. 
Now, standard deviation is the one that we looked at in real detail in lesson. Now, standard deviation is a much more useful measure of dispersion because it will tell me how far each score is away from the mean. Now, the smaller the standard deviation, the more the scores are clustered around the mean, and the larger the standard deviation, the more spread out the scores are. Now, you have to have the mean to do a standard deviation. They're like best pals, remember it that way. Where there is a mean, you will do a standard deviation because essentially with a standard deviation, you're calculating how far the scores are away from the mean. Now, if you look, just so I can try and explain this a little bit better, if you look at the top diagram where the scores are quite closely clustered around the four, we would expect a small standard deviation on that if the mean value was four. Now, if you look at the diagram below, the scores are quite spread out away from the value number five. So if the mean was five on that occasion, I would expect a large standard deviation. Now, you can see on the screen the formula for standard deviation. Now, don't panic because you will be given that formula on the exam, but you need to be able to know how to use that formula. And the best way to do that is to work out what all the symbols mean and be able to use the formula logically. Now, it's been suggested, and again, I don't know because it's the first year of your new spec, but it's been suggested that you won't have to do this from start to finish as in calculate a standard deviation. It's much more likely that you'll be given a table where aspects are done for you and you need to fill in the gaps. So just bear that in mind. Now, what you need to be able to do here is to be able to understand the formula and get this to make a little bit more sense to you. So if we look here where we've got the sigma, now, sigma means sum of. So if we take the top row of the formula here, we are working out the sum of whatever the raw score minus the mean is squared. And then we're going to divide that by the number of participants minus one. And once we've got that, we're going to do the square root of that answer and that will give you the standard deviation. So let's have a little look. So you can see on my table here that I've got my raw scores on the left hand side. Now the first thing I want to do is calculate the mean. Now to do that I've added up all of those raw scores and I've divided by the number of numbers, so the number of participants. And you can see on the bottom left that my mean here is 7.3. Now my step two is working out the raw data, take away the mean. So I've now got the mean, so I'm going to take the mean away from all of my raw data. So if you have a look here at my second column, this is done. I've done, if you look at the first row, I've done 6 minus 7.3, which has given me an answer of minus 1.3. done 5 minus 7.3, which has given me an answer of minus 2.3, and so on and so on. Now my step 3, because my raw score minus my mean was in brackets with the squared on the outside, it means squared everything inside that bracket. So now I've worked out what's inside the bracket, I need to square it. So what I'm going to do now is take the second column, and square each of the values. Now what's quite interesting here is even the negative values that we've got within the second column, a negative times a negative will always be a positive. So all of my answers within the third column now should be a positive value. So now you can see we've got the third column filled in. So all I've done is taken the value from the second column and I've squared them. And obviously you've got a calculator in the exam to do all of this for you. Now my step four as circled is the sigma, it's the sum of, it's adding them all together. So all I've literally done is taken all the numbers within column three and added them together. Now if we go back to my formula, I've actually done the, the top row now. What I need to do now is divide by n minus one. Now don't forget n is number of participants. And if we remember, I had 10 sets of raw data, therefore I'm going to presume I've got 10 participants. So if I do 10 minus one, I'm going to get nine. So if I take my previous value, my 92.1, and I divide that by 9, I get 10.233. Now, a common mistake at 10.233 is that people stop. They think that's it. What you have to remember is that square root sign and the square root of everything we've calculated so far. So my final value is 3.2. Uh, sorry, it wasn't. It was 10.233. So I'm going to do the square root of 10.233, which is going to give me 3.2. Now, the last one that I want to have a quick look at with you is the interquartile range. Now, this is literally when we take our data set and we split it into quarters. So my Q1, my, quarter, my first quartile, is a quarter of the way through. Q2 is obviously the median. It's worth noticing that that's obviously halfway through. Q3 is the third quartile. And then obviously my fourth quartile is the end. Now, the advantage of the interquartile range over the range is that, again, it's less affected by outliers. So one set of data, one, one number, isn't going to just completely skew my, my calculations. This is really important that you remember, girls, which one goes with which. So, for example, where you are calculating the mode as your measure of central tendency, your measure of dispersion needs to be the range. As discussed, where you're calculating the mean, 
you must then calculate the standard deviation and the median goes with the interquartile range which makes sense because obviously the median is within the interquartile range Okay, very quickly then moving on to graphs, you need to be able, according to the spec, to display different bits of data within a graph. Now the one you need to do the most is, is a bar graph, and I'm sure you know what this is. This allows us to compare different columns uh, of frequencies in order to be able to compare results. It's really important to remember here that when you're drawing your graph, your x-axis, and don't forget x is across, so your x-axis is always the one that goes across the screen, should always represent the IV, so whatever it is that's been manipulated within that study. And your y-axis should always be the result. Now if you want to have a practice at that, have a look at drawing a bar chart for the following information on the screen. If you just press pause, you can have a go. Now this is really important because, again, a sample assessment material, so a SAMS from Edexcel, exam question here where three marks is allocated just from being able to draw an appropriate graph to represent the results. Now obviously you need to assess which is the IV and therefore which goes on the x-axis. But what's interesting when we have a look at the mark scheme is how your three marks are allocated. Now this to me is a really nice easy three marks because one of your marks is for drawing the bars correctly, your second mark is for approving the act, uh, approving, uh, labeling the axes appropriately and your third mark is for adding a title and it actually prompted you to do that anyway.